the president has previously said that he has never discussed overseas business dealings with his son, but the White House now says that the president has never been in business with his son. So why the updated language? Which statement is true? Or is this semantics and they're both true? Uh, as I stated on Monday, when I was asked this question multiple times, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed so on this. Nothing true. has changed on this. Uh, and so could ask me a million different ways uh, on this question, nothing has changed. The 2024 Republican presidential primary field is taking shape. The battle lines are becoming clearer, and so is the field of candidates. Is the odds on favorites, if you look at the polling, still Trump versus Biden? That seems to be it, but it's just way too early to tell. I'm more angry now, and I'm more committed now than I ever was. Big challenge for these candidates is going to be how do they navigate Donald Trump? And, and how do they navigate Ron DeSantis? You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. Welcome back to a special Friday edition of the Ruthless Variety program. Uh, fellas, we're really breaking our backs around here. Smash... Uh, who was that that was on the the front of the program? Why, that was none other than Karine jean Pierre. <laughs> it sure was. And she, in all of her uh, delightful stylings, mm -hmm. managed to say uh, nothing at all, uh, except contradict herself fairly significantly, I would say, in that the framework that the White House used or that the campaign used about him never discussing business dealings it clearly has been abandoned. Mm -hmm. White House will not repeat that line. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when it's presented back to them, uh, they say nothing has changed without repeating that line. But then the line that they do offer is that he wasn't in business. And uh, <laughs> well, I, I got to say, bye, oh, bye. I'm pleased. I'm pleased by this line of questioning from the White House. It's something. Mm -hmm. Correspondence. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, maybe we got some listeners of the Variety program. We talked about this on the Tuesday episode. Well, you know? it, it turns out when you when you set a smoking revolver down next to the dead body, somebody might ask questions about this <laughs> yeah. sort of thing. Right. And now we're at the point in the program where I guess uh, they can't ignore it. Uh, well, you love to see it. You love to see it. Hey, we're getting very excited about a whole range of things. But I mean, really, we've been doing three, four episodes a week. I don't know if you guys have noticed. I mean, the content, you know, out there, the, the amount of news that we have to cover ha has just been tremendous. And, and like you said, I mean, we've also got Iowa coming up. We've got yeah. our uh, pregame show for the debate coming up. You know, and, and, and there's we a have, lot happening. And we have King of the Hill for you today. We have King of the Hill today, and we've got a great guest, Frank LaRose. He's in Iowa, or Ohio, I'm sorry. Jeez, I've offended everyone, including... <laughs> I yeah. think I think Smash has like burned Ohio so deeply into my brain at this point. I just want to ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is the heart of it all. Oh, uh, come on. But but he's an Ohio Senate candidate, current Secretary of State. Uh, you're going to want to get that interview. It's a good one uh, at the end of this. Where should we start? I think, you know what, look, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't, given my inbox and the number of inquiries that I've gotten from the mainstream Met, uh, press who have an amazing ability to only focus on things that are uh, anti-Republican. Uh, the McConnell issue yesterday where he clearly uh, had a problem at the microphones for 15, 18 seconds or something like that. Um, I spoke with him right afterwards. Uh, he had excused himself from the microphone, started walking back to his office, all of a sudden started feeling better, came back address the questions, I think, longer than usual. I mean, he usually does three, four questions. I think he did five or six yesterday. Uh, went back to his office, voted all day, and then went to a, like a Major League Baseball gala or something like that at night. So he's fine. Um, clearly, it was a scary issue, and any time that anything like that happens to somebody. I saw uh, the other day there was a, a newscaster where two of them were standing out in the heat and this guy just sort of tipped over. Anytime you see stuff like that, it scares you, mm -hmm. you know, particularly in the era of like, you know, watching people with, with medical issues on live television. It's, it's, it's crazy. The good news is he's fine. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the bad news is everybody makes a, a big deal out of things like that, uh, that, they don't make a big deal when it's a partisan deal on the other side. Yeah, but and again, this morning he delivered a stem winder about how Democrats are spending us into oblivion and giving everything away to China. Nobody covers that. Right. 
No, right. nobody, nobody covered that he was like at working it at this gala last night into the end of the night. Nobody was covering the the, the questions that he answered, stood and answered yesterday. Like it's just the press is against Republicans. It's just the way it is. There, there are a handful out there. You guys give me a hard time yeah, for you're adding buddies. this caveat. You're there are, there are reporters out there who are trying to get it right and who often actually do um and they they fight like hell to be able to get it through at their papers those 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 people exist yeah and 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 our listeners should know it but by and large the media is so biased but it, and they are it, so it, against republicans you know if he had s- stood there at the lectern and said he cured cancer it just would have been another day in the west wing <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> excellent point michael yeah it's nice to see the press uh, focused on that kind of thing these days but anyway good news for that um we touched on a little bit yesterday, but want to get a little bit deeper into this whole Hunter Biden plea deal mm-hmm. because it's confusing. And unless you're a lawyer, like very hard to follow along. We were told weeks ago that there was a deal that had come together between DOJ and Hunter Biden's lawyers uh, to give him a couple of misdemeanor slaps on the wrist for uh, basically a felony gun charge and a felony tax evasion charge and people were rightly extremely upset about that uh but everybody thought it was a fait accompli i mean it, it was all done typically when doj makes these kind of deals it's a, that's the end of it well they showed up at court yesterday and uh, <laughs> uh the judge was not uh convinced at all that it was a done deal didn't like the fact that there was some discrepancy in how they were describing what this deal was i think hunter biden's attorneys it appeared to me based on what i read uh, basically sought to have their client be immune from all future prosecution, which, of course, is not... I mean, that's insane. Yeah. That's insane. And DOJ appeared not to want that. Uh, you know, you can be a conspiracy theorist about this, because we've talked about this on the program before, about all of the the details of this investigation and this prosecution are, are under seal because there are charges pending. If the case was resolved, it would not be under seal. It would all be public information. And so we've pontificated on this program about whether or not DOJ wants to keep cases open in order to just keep it under wraps and then ultimately never bring charges. Mm-hmm. Now, that again, you're we're applying all kinds of motives that may or may not exist, but given the fact that this is the DOJ we've dealt with over the last couple of years it's not the craziest assertion there is yeah i mean that's the thing is there was uh, a lot of discussion happening of whether doj actually wanted to keep this open uh to later eventually down the road kill it but in the meantime essentially stonewall for any you know house republican investigations or anything to be like oh no there's actually a department of justice investigation going on so don't worry about it you know we got it covered but i i think the assup- assumption here is uh that those you know, pending charges or the the investigation that's still underway is related to, you know, fair violations, things yeah, like that's, that. Yeah, that's 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 uh, foreign. Uh, I forget the acronym. Yeah, yeah it's but a it's... foreign agent. I think it's Registration Act or whatever. His failure to register as a foreign agent, yeah. lobbying the United States government on behalf of a foreign country. Um, Which may be related to Ukraine. It may yeah. be, it may be related to China. Yeah, like it exactly. may be related to all kinds of different things. But the Im- the important thing for listeners to think about there, and why that is so dangerous in a way that a tax charge or a gun charge or not is, you know, who was he lobbying? <laughs> who was he lobbying in the American government that he would have failed to register to lobby? His dad. Yeah. Yep. Right. And yeah. so that's where you start to see. Uh, you know the the ties get closer and closer to to the president of the United States. So which I, is made which is made more complicated by the fact that the House of Representatives, Jamie Comer, and the Oversight Committee announced that next week they will be deposing in private an individual who was the best friend of Hunter Biden, who allegedly is going to testify that Joe Biden was on conference calls with <laughs> Hunter mm-hmm. and the Barisma peeps. But I mean, if that's the, as vice president, as we talk and we belabored this on on the previous episode. But if that is the case, like, look, Katie, bar the door. Yeah. Right. We're ready. Well, this is going to get this thing's going to. But the idea that he was about to walk away from this sweetheart plea deal 
because it didn't do exactly what he felt like his daddy told him he was promised. What mm-hmm. a spoiled brat. That, that tells this you. guy is the absolute lowest of the low. He doesn't have to repay his taxes. Any other person who did what he did and didn't pay their taxes on it, they'd have to at least repay the taxes. Yeah. He's not doing community service. He's not going into a soup kitchen to try to make restitution. His dad helped him out, mm-hmm. and he was whining because he felt like his dad didn't help him enough. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that he wants to <laughs> think about that. It's, yeah. it's, it's stunning. One thing uh, I, I think it's really good to bring up is, you know, we've mentioned how the press is starting to talk about this, the mainstream media, which is really surprising. Um, there was an example today, Matthias uh, Schwartz, who writes for Insider, uh, a of, no, uh, of nothing, just brought up these old stories he had worked on about Hunter Biden, which he's like, people have forgotten about. These things, there have not been discussed. An example is the article he wrote uh, where Hunter Biden quoted $2 million as a potential fee for getting billions of Libyan government money unfrozen. <laughs> this is while his father was vice president. He bragged about access to state, treasury, and the Chinese government, according to an email. And this is an email not from his laptop. This what is separate. talking about? I mean, that's just an entirely different country and different issue than the Burisma issue or the China issue. Mm-hmm. God, he's such a renaissance man. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> and, but again, you go back to the fact that this dude is like, if there was one human being who's walking the face of this planet who you would not hire to go sit in a boardroom with anybody, it's probably him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's zero qualification for and, this. And that's the thing is the obviousness of this situation is clear to to everybody. Everybody knows why these companies, governments, et cetera, are wiring money to Hunter Biden. It's not because he's got great management techniques. It's not because he understands how the energy industry in Ukraine <laughs> works. It's because his dad was the vice president. It's because he has that access to power. And now someone is going to be telling the House Republicans as they're deposed that his father was on those calls. Yeah. Oh. If you were hiring a crank double for an OnlyFans site, he's your man. I mean, like, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but an energy consult, it seems like a far, far fetched. And the Libyans. I and mean, they tried to kill Doc Brown for crying out loud. Because <laughs> I mean, he gave him used pinball parts instead of a nuclear weapon. <laughs> <laughs> Doc Brown, good lord, did that just date all of us? Yeah. Uh, I love that so much. But anyway, the the long and the short of it is, the judge said thanks, but no thanks, and they're going to have to reconvene and represent some kind of an understanding between the two sides. We'll see how that. I mean, color me skeptical. Yeah, same. That this whole thing is going to end up where this guy faces justice, but it is what. Hey, look, it's a small victory, and I have to imagine. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but I have to imagine. Some of this as is a result of programs like this one, Mm -hmm. the good work that like Brett Baer on Fox is doing by making a serious news product Mm -hmm. uh, available for people to understand Mm -hmm. and raising the temperature in all of this where a judge can't in good conscience be like, oh, let's sweep this under the rug. Right. And it forces the White House to respond. I don't know if you guys saw where they... (laughs) Oh yeah, this is the White so- House said we we Hunter Biden will not be pardoned. <laughs> it's, it's like pardoned. They released what? That's He's an incredible statement. What? That like He's the White not House will not pardon jail. Hunter but, Biden. But, but, but also also like didn't he plead not guilty? <laughs> like nothing's been settled yet. <laughs> Like you imagine your dad's be like, I'm definitely once he's guilty, I'm definitely not gonna let him off. And okay. you're like, but Dad, I'm in trial. You <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's incredible. What I mean, staying on the legal news, it uh, up to this moment as we're recording this, all kinds of rumors about whether or not another Trump indictment is going to come down. This felt a little bit more imminent than it did last week when they started leaking out that that or Trump actually leaked out that he'd been contacted and said that he was a target in an investigation, that uh, typically there's a short time period before an actual indictment comes down. People speculated that that was going to be this afternoon. It has not been the case. All kinds of stories about why it would not be the case. Maybe it's tomorrow, whatever. It was NBC News who reported that uh, Trump's lawyers had been contacted by the government saying that there will be an indictment. The thing that I, I think really is the question is when. Like mm. there was a lot of speculation would be today. Anyone's guess is as good as mine as when that would happen. And this is, just to refresh everybody's memory, the Jack Smith special counsel who is focusing on January 6th and the events after the 2020 election. 
who knows? We'll read the indictment when it comes down. We'll give it everything you, you, you deserve to hear on that. But again, I feel like we're so up to our eyeballs in legal news. I mean, I feel mm. we ought to get Bill Barr as like a, a, a consistent commentator on the show just so we can keep up with all <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah, there's a lot of legal news that is definitely going on. Maybe Nancy Stan Grace. Helping. I wonder what Nancy Grace is up to these days. I think she's around. I, th- I mean, she covered so much legal news in her day. Totally. Wonder what she's thinking. Totally. We maybe get Christopher Darden back. I get the whole OJ crew right. <laughs> involved. Uh, you've got a home here at the Ruthless Variety program. Anyway, uh, we're very excited about the Milwaukee debate. We've talked about it a lot, um, and we've had further conversations this afternoon that are extremely exciting yeah. about what it is that we're about to embark upon. Uh, but the, the reason we're there is the debate itself. And as of this very moment... Seven Republicans made the August debate, but the stage is far from set, according to Politico. Uh, The August Republican debate is the first big chance for Donald Trump to face his rivals if he decides to show up. Trump and six of his rivals have already met qualifications to make the stage. How many will join them and whether so many candidates will qualify for the Republican National Committee uh, that will need to hold two debates is still up in the up in the air. Um, I I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, the 40,000 threshold was enough where we're probably not going to have a 2016 JV debate stage, Mm -hmm. I think, uh, which makes some sense. And I know we've had some people on the show that disagree vehemently with that, but there are people like Doug Burgum, who was unknown outside of the state of North Dakota, who figured it out. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that's the kind of president you want is somebody who can figure that stuff out. Uh, they got seven people currently in there, and that is Trump, Ron DeSantis, Ramaswamy, Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Chris Christie, and Doug Burgum. Uh, if I'm a betting man, given the team that Mike Pence has, particularly uh, inside and outside, um, I bet he gets to the stage two. I'd be surprised if it went beyond that. I don't know. I mean, look, we had Larry Elder on the <laughs> on the show on Tuesday, and he had just a viral moment mm-hmm. that went on the internet, and I think there was millions of views on our show, which, hey, you know, we appreciate that. Uh, so he has the capacity of reaching a ton, whether he can convert that into people giving him a buck, I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, the guy ran for governor, and he built a large, small dollar file and raised millions of dollars. So he comes to the table with some infrastructure. So it's totally possible. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, like the story he tells is definitely one that motivates people and animates a small dollar universe. So I wouldn't be shocked if he does, but I agree. I mean, I think if Pence does get there after that, it's, it's pretty narrow who else I think could, could actually get there. I, I, I completely agree. So I, I Look, this is where the rubber meets the road. And we've been largely talking about process. We're talking about infrastructures. We're talking about what teams look like, whether they've had to fire staff, you know, what people are doing from a political process point of view. That's where this changes. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to actually see these people that are going to be able to evaluate each other and they're going to (laughs) fight on stage, right? Which is why we're there. And that to me is an all timer. Like this is... The 2016 debates were so great Mm -hmm. for so many reasons. This seems to me like just an essential part of the democratic process as we look out to how 2024 ultimately resolves itself. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the the kind of like news cycle that some of these candidates are having, specifically Ron DeSantis. It's been an incredibly tough week for him. I would say this is probably the toughest week his campaign has faced. I don't know like what's going on behind the scenes. Like another New York Times story came out. It seems like there's friction now between the campaign and the super PAC. And I mean, you do not want these stories to be out there when you're trying to essentially do kind of like a campaign reboot. Yep. I don't know what the cause of any of this. Well, the problem is, and we all remember Jeb 2016, the problem is, is once your campaign becomes the story, everybody starts looking for cracks in the armor, Mm -hmm. right? Nobody cares if Vivek rolls into an event and has like less than anticipated number of people if ron DeSantis does it right now it's a front page story in the new york times Mm. yeah you know everything in politics is about setting expectations yeah you know if the expectations are low you're not going to disappoint anyone yeah but when you roll into the thing is like the guy who's going to take on donald trump like you said Every reporter is going to look for a way to get behind the scenes there and figure out what's not happening and what is happening. Yeah, I mean, he if he rolls into an event with a zipper down, yeah, it's going to be a front pager. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, but it, that's part of the process, man. It's yeah. bright lights. It's bright lights. And this is what we talked about last year mm-hmm. when we were saying, like, we're very excited about the, all of this because there's a bunch of really talented people. We don't know what happens. We know with Trump what happened when he got on the big stage, he got bigger. Mm-hmm. We don't know if all these extremely talented people who've got incredible teams and incredible messages. What happens when the bright lights come on? I mean, there are so many storylines to follow. So many storylines to follow. You guys mentioned Ron DeSantis. You mentioned Mike Pence. Is he going to, you know, he's had a lot of time to think about what his former boss said and did about him. What's he going to do if he's able to stand up toe to toe with the guy? Yeah. Chris Christie. I mean, he's done exactly what he said he was going to do. Yeah. That guy is going to be entertaining. We know he's going to be entertaining. And can anybody land a shot on the king? I think that that's the real question. And I really hope that Trump shows up. I think it's incumbent upon him to show up because if he's still got it, it'll show. Yeah. If he doesn't, it'll show. I think he probably still has it. I I mean, mean, I I think he's got more to gain than lose. Like, you know, conventional wisdom would be like, okay, I have this lead in the polls. Why, why, you know, shake the boat. Let's just let him have it. I'm not going to show up. But if he shows up and just, like you said, shows he's still the king, mm-hmm. savages everyone on that stage, <laughs> I think that does more of an argument for like, oh boy, you know, he may have this locked up than if he just doesn't show at all. I think that's right. I mean, there is definitely an opportunity if he shows up to just put this thing to bed. Mm. There are no zero opportunity to put this thing to bed if he doesn't. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah, and the question is, it doesn't mean that he's ultimately going to not win, but like you can... Put, like it's whether you drop in a prevent D here, mm-hmm. yeah, totally. or or whether you you're you're throwing long still, and he's always struck me as a politician that continues to throw long no matter what the advice was yep. mm-hmm. against them. This would be a departure from that. Mm-hmm. So we will see. Um, here's some uh, little things that we've come across that we think are worth your attention. Uh, an electric car warning. You've heard us talking a lot about this Mm -hmm. topic Mm -hmm. because the Biden administration is attempting through both tax incentives and EPA regulations to eliminate the gasoline powered car. And I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that eliminate. And it it, it doesn't mean that, you know, they're going to try to get more electric cars. They want only electric cars on the road. And then polling has shown that Americans the majority of Americans do not want an electric car, and this, their policy continues to just jam it down their throats. There was a New York Times article last week about how Ford had to slash prices on the F-150 because nobody in the Midwest wanted to buy an electric F-150. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Oh, of course. Right. I mean, I just grow up, spend a little time in the Midwest, and you're like, right. you're the guy that rolls him with the car. like, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, and your buddies are going to be like, get the fuck out of here. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just don't want that. Uh, but they apparently are going to trudge forward anyway. And what's happening is the components that are required to make these cars, the same people who are forcing you to buy these cars are are banning the extraction of the minerals in this country to produce them. Mm-hmm. And it takes like 10 years to get one of these things online. And currently we don't have anywhere near enough to even have like 10% of what they want done in the United States. And so like you actually can't get there without being entirely reliant on China and China production. Mm -hmm. Part of this story, and this was in Axios, is that Chinese automakers want to sell electric cars across America. (laughs) Surprise, surprise, (laughs) surprise. I mean, talk about a terrible idea. Inexpensive electric cars from China have quickly gained a toehold in Europe Mm. and could be taking over American driveways next. Mm. The Biden administration is incentivizing rapid vehicle, rapid electric vehicle adoption while also trying to reduce U.S. dependence on Chinese EV supply chains. The second part of that is fiction. It's absolute lie. What they've done is given a bunch of taxpayer giveaways to certain companies to build Chinese battery plants in the United States. So they're technically manufactured in the United States. What do you think they use? To put those batteries together, robots. No, I no, no. Th- no th- but, oh. but, but like, what parts? Chinese. Oh, Chinese parts. Chinese parts. Oh, well, I guess the point I'm getting at. I thought this guy was supposed to be the labor candidate from the Democratic side, and and here he is. If you are handing the entire American auto industry over to the Chinese, what does that do to auto workers? I mean, not only does it take fewer workers to make an electric car. If you are outsourcing even more of a like an American industry that actually matters to this country. 
to China, what does that do to auto workers who are already struggling and concerned about what, how are they going to continue to to uh, to help their families? And I mean, he's crushing them. To me, the most obvious problem with this seems to be okay. We've already known now that TikTok is essentially a Chinese <laughs> spyware app that right. is just monitoring everything that you are up to if you install that on your phone. Now imagine that being your car. Right. It knows exactly where you go, at what time, what you're doing. It, it's it's monitoring every single facet of your family's life. It knows where your kids go to school. It's It knows everything about you. And all that is getting saved by the Chinese government. The, They've already had instances where they hacked uh, OMB here. They've built large files. It's estimated that every single American in the United States has a file on them kept by the Chinese government. That's that they're trying to assemble your credit reports, that they're trying to assemble if this person might be, uh, uh, it's possible that they know any sensitive information. Would we be able to blackmail them? Every single, over 350 million individual American files are in the hands of the Chinese government. They keep trying to build it. Imagine if they now have a car to track you. The, the greatest trick China ever pulled was convincing us to outsource our domestic energy capacity to them. Mm -hmm. It's, it's they absolutely They have zero incredible. in terms of their ability to do that with their own resources, and right. yet they figured out how to do it mm -hmm. by acquiring African mines, right? Mm -hmm. They come in after we leave Afghanistan and go access rare earth materials in Afghanistan and in places that we yeah. abandon. They do all of these things and they become the centralized place of election. And then because of climate change, you now have governments all over the world that are adopting which technology? The one that you have at home? No. Nope. No. No. No, the Chinese one. No. And nobody wants to talk about the fact that there's electric cars have to plug into the fucking wall. Right. Mm -hmm. And the wall, where does that power come from? Yeah. It ain't, it, it's not, it doesn't, it's not a, like a recharge. This is not a magic trick. Right. Like it also the coal and the natural gas and stuff are doing that. Right. So like all you've done is triple the capacity on the grid to deal with that. There's no environmental benefit whatsoever. Right. I mean, it's just like, if you were trying to sabotage, I don't know what you'd do to change. It's, yeah. And it's not by accident. And the, you know, this is a clear strategy from the CCP to try to influence American politics and push us towards buying their green energy stuff here. There's a, another story sort of related here from CNN, an investigation. The title is Exclusive. A Baltimore musician was hired to organize a protest. He says he never knew his client had links to pro-China operatives. Oh, wow. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So the gist of this story is, um, you know, this guy was like doing freelance work through, you know, websites like Fiverr or stuff like that. And he got an offer to like show up and do this protest, this like uh, racial justice protest, you know, end the violence, peace for all, all this sort of stuff. Said he had like no idea who these people were it, it it turns out uh that it was a pr firm in china mm. um that promotes the chinese government's interests and similar to the way that like the chinese spies recruit assets in the united states where the first time is is a no biggie like there's no direct connection to what they're trying to accomplish they just want to see if you're open for yeah. business yeah oh don't give us any secrets we just want to know what's going on i mean that's how those that's how these spies recruit assets in the united states so they do that protest then they come back with another protest and this protest is a little bit different this one's a little more on the nose if you will <laughs> Basically, he want, uh, uh, this this Chinese PR firm wanted uh, this uh, this guy to do a protest uh, about uh, allowing goods from uh, Xinjiang, uh, the province where the Uyghurs are being imprisoned <laughs> in concentration camps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were carrying around signs. And this is where you get the connection here. And you see the sleight of hand. Here's the sign. I'm getting heated. Leave my solar panels alone. There it is. Uh, <laughs> there it is. Because <laughs> the government, the Democrats are coming for your solar panel. Well, yeah, but that's, like the fact that they are, they have, like just Holmes said, they've gotten our uh, government to believe in sabotaging America, outsourcing production of everything. There's an entire political party energy. dedicated to their interests, right. whether they know it or not, and they're blindly hundreds of millions of Americans who go like, I'm a Democrat and I believe in all this stuff. And then like nobody does the math back to be like, hey dude, you're actually just A, putting yourself out of work, 
B, making your entirely beholden on a, on a hostile country. C, what happens if you get into a COVID situation and they decide, like, well, we're done. Yeah. We're done. We're not, we're not shipping it. No more cars, guys. Chinese no solar stuff. power. Nice. You're going to be... Chinese cars. Like this place is going to look like Cuba. We're yeah. going to be driving around 57 Chevys. Yeah. I I mean, that doesn't sound too bad. Actually. I actually no, get on board with a 57 cool. Chevy. But it is wild, though, like in the bigger picture. You got Hans, your vice mm -hmm. in Switzerland, Swiss billionaire, funding the entire dark money network on the left that does a lot of this environmental radicalism. Yep. And now you have connections to the CCP directly. It's like all these foreign interests are working in the United States to disrupt our American energy yep. supply chain. Yep. This is a serious national security issue. I remember back when we had Pompeo on the show months mm -hmm. and months ago, mm -hmm. and he sort of laid out some of these problems that we have in the United States with um, with Chinese assets. It is a huge deal, and whoever does become the next president of the United States has to tackle it on day one. They do. 100%. They do. All right, so we're going to play a game here, fellas, and guess who your judge and cherry is today? The Honorable Josh Holmes yeah. presiding. And I'm bailiff, and I'm going to run a pretty tight court here okay. uh, i'm gonna be i'm gonna be using the stopwatch i don't want to see i like law and order time. you know how i like law and order yeah it's gonna be a serious serious uh court um would expect nothing less you've got our champion sherry sherry jacobus uh who are you bringing matthew dowd dowd all right well let's go ringside ladies and gentlemen you're attention please it's time for king of the hill in the red corner fighting from an empty campaign office in texas a matthew mail pattern down and now in the blue corner fighting out of her own twitter account and current champion of the world Kami Cherry Jacobus. <laughs> it just doesn't get old. It's so good. And listen to the crowd. They just can't get enough no, of it. They love it. They can't they can't get enough of it. They're just they're uh, uh, wild. Yeah. Wild. Sent them into a frenzy. Upright. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to do it live in Iowa. Okay, Mr. Champion, uh your court. Okay. If it please the court. I will now read the tweet. You're already five seconds in. <laughs> Eric Swalwell's an absolute beast, and I'm here for all of it. <laughs> Smiley face with sunglasses. Candidates for Congress should study him, learn from him, and emulate him because this is how you do it. And if you want to know the truth, Newt Gingrich did the same. <laughs> and one in the mid-1990s, I was there. Yes! Wow. That is a strong opener. That is a strong opener. Can I ask, because I'm having trouble seeing, uh, the Swalwell, do we have any idea what it is that he's talking about here? He's attacking Republicans, Your Honor, um, in the on any worst, topic. worst possible way. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just going to leave it at that. Counselor, your rejoinder. Okay, so continuing this theme of, you know, supposed conservatives trying to encourage uh, Republicans to go Democrat. This is from Matthew Dowd. What number is this on the? This is number nine. Thank you for reminding me, Judge. Uh, it says here Mitt Romney would have more effect on who is GOP nominee if he and Murkowski and others announced that if Trump is the nominee in 2024, they will become independents <laughs> and caucus with the Dems in order to keep the GOP MAGA in line. Incredible theory that like the best way to help the Republicans is to caucus with the Dems and help the Dems win. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally makes sense to me. It's, it's almost like he doesn't have our best interests at heart. <laughs> <laughs> Remind me, isn't Mitt Romney up for re-election in 2024? He is. Well, that seems like- That will pretty, help him in the primary pretty, too, I think. <laughs> pretty, rough, pretty rough hand of cards going into a Republican primary. Yeah. Um, boy, both of these, both of these are first class openers. I, I salute both councils. Um, I will say anyone who says that Eric Swalwell is a genius worth emulating is just an amazingly out of touch human being. And that, that, that takes a lot to consider. 
On the other hand, the idea that Lisa Murkowski and an in-cycle Mitt Romney can somehow tilt the balance of a Republican primary electorate (laughs) blows me away. The logic of that is inescapably horrible, and for that reason, Smug wins round one. Outstanding. I'm ready for round two. Let's do it. So this is number seven, uh, Wolf. It says, rest in peace, Ulysses S. Grant, past this day, 1885, led Union Army to victory in Civil War, protected civil rights of blacks during Reconstruction, prosecuted relentlessly the KKK. There are but two parties now, traitors and patriots. Wait, <laughs> so essentially, how do, skip, how do we skip to that? You agree. <laughs> After this, you know, introduction, he says, there's two people. You agree with me? Or you're a traitor. May, 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 may I ask a question? Is that a quote? Because it's in quotes. Is that a quote from Ulysses S. Grant? That's the best part. Is I looked and it's not. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Oh my. I think he's just like eulogizing. And he's like, quote me. He's like fake eulogizing. <laughs> just, just so he can call Republicans traitors. Wait, so that quote is not actually from Ulysses S. Grant. That's Matthew Dowd. Can I get the bailiff, while we move on, can I get the bailiff to double check that? Because if that is the case, that is material information for this court. Smash. Okay. Your Honor. Um, uh, If it pleases the court, I would like to submit Cherry Jacobus number six, please. Um. Cherry Jacobus, number six. Hold on. Sorry. Well, the Sorry. bailiff has come back with instructions for the court. Come back um, with evidence um, from a reliable source, the National Endowment for the Humanities. Okay. A .gov website. That is a .gov website. A primary source. Yeah. It was, in fact, Grant who wrote, there are but no, two but, parties now, traitors and patriots. No, it, the, and I want that's hereafter a, that's to a, be ranked with the latter. That's a that's a deep state website. Everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh go ahead, counsel. Number six, please. Cherry Jacobus. Once you realize those you trusted can't be trusted, you question things they told you when you believed you were working towards a common good, comma, but simply had different approaches, period. Climate change is real. Confusing twenty twenty three oligarchy with eighties capitalism is folly. It's the guns. What? And what you can't Wait, what? see here, what you can't see here, Your Honor, is that um, this is also a case of misuse of the Internet. Uh, Cherry Jacobus retweeted herself on this instance. Hold on, hold on. Once you realize those you trust that can't be trusted, you question things they told you when you believed we were all working towards a common good, but simply had different approaches, climate change is real. I don't understand the connection there. Confusing 2023 oligarchy with 80 capitalism is folly. Okay, that seems like a different thing. And then uh, it's the guns. Mm-hmm. Um, There's just like weird and random. It's just three non sequiturs. That is absolutely bonkers shit. I was inclined to give counsel a victory here because the court felt misled on the quote. And Bailiff helpfully corrected it. But I think you've earned the victory either way with that. And so uh, second round goes to Ashbrook. Thank wow. You, All the marbles. Here it is, round three, and it's a big one. Um, so this is a difficult decision, uh, Your Honor, and I'm going to do my best to pick the one that may speak to the court. Bailiff's uh, getting itchy. Uh, Lee, may I please see uh, Exhibit 2? <laughs> this week there was a UFO hearing in Congress. <laughs> And Cherry Jacobus I, this, writes. I feel like I feel like he did a little studying on the judge and jury on this topic. <laughs> Cherry Jacobus writes. Decades ago, my uncle, who lives out in the country in Illinois, saw something: <laughs> the lights, the hovering, scared the crap out of him. The sudden flight slash disappearance. They keep tabs on this boring little rock, but we're problematic and slow, and not worth too much of their time. <laughs> Jesus so Christ halfway the through, Jesus. she is. She is explaining what the aliens are thinking and why they don't care about us. They keep tabs on us. Earth, I I assume, can only assume, Your Honor, Earth is the boring little rock and that humans are What's the time? How long is Ashbrook reading this essay for? And not worth much of their time. He just passed a minute. He's fine. Um, Your Honor, I 
I'll I appreciate that, Counsel. Thank you. I think this is actually one of the most sober things she's said. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to reserve my judgment until the end. Smug. This is Matthew Dowd. Uh, it goes with a great trope of uh, actually. What, what number is this? Exhibit? This is this is number eight. Um, it goes with a great trope of actually Joe Biden is a good Catholic. It says if white evangelical <laughs> Christians and conservative Catholics really cared about having a person of deep faith in the White House, they would overwhelmingly vote for Biden over Trump. The fact they don't tells us so much about their wow. belief system. So their belief system, if you're pro-choice, oh, you don't believe in shit if you don't back Joe Biden. This is essentially you ain't black, but for any Christian. I can't. It's the most incendiary thing that. to say. Your belief in your religion is bullshit if you don't back Joe Biden. So, all right. So here's the problem that I have is that this to me is pure, solid 14 karat gold in that it blows me. The problem is for me is that he does play this card relatively frequently. Mm -hmm. He does as a connoisseur of Matthew Dowd. I'll tell you, like his number one issue is always to try to paint Christians generally as like they're not really, they don't really believe because they vote Republican. And so that's a genre. Where this thing differs a bit is he gets into specifics with evangelical and Catholics. He's covering a lot of waterfront on yeah. this and being very specific. And it is, I mean, that is an insult of the highest order. If we can bring back the Sherry one one more time, I just want to have a look at this. Yeah, what number was that? Uh, y y thank you. Um, what I love about Sherry is she describes how, not surprisingly, her family has had an alien encounter. <laughs> <laughs> that does not surprise me. I feel like that that in and of itself is probably the most par for the course yeah, shit that I've heard that tracks. in all of King of the Hill. What is particularly good, though, is that she transitions from this encounter with uh, the unknown to ascribing the motives of the unknown. With so much confidence. Uh, to say that, that we are not worth their time. <laughs> I got to be honest, dude. I am. This is one of the tough. I haven't been doing this nearly as long as Duncan. But in the time I have, I have not been presented with two arguments that are as quality as this that will decide ultimately where we go here. I am absolutely conflicted. Both of these are fucking bonkers takes. Bonkers takes. <sighs> I think because it's new, I think because it's brand new, I'm gonna go with Matt or I'm gonna go with Sherry Jacobus and wow. the alien thing because I've never heard it before. It is brand new, and she now knows the motives of the aliens, and therefore, Ashbrook's the victory. I think it's it's well judged. <laughs> it's an absolute robbery, and Thank you, you know, I guess that's what we're used to around here with these terrible judges. <laughs> 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 I think so, I think in a in a tie situation, novelty probably wins. Novelty and, wins. I, I, I get that. I get that. In, in your honor, in the interest of the, what's the timer on this guy? He's, he's still, still going. Still. No, he's no, he's now he's got to take his victory lap. It's he's got to spike happening. the football can, and end. In, in the game. interest of entertaining the audience, your honor, can we please just pop up a few other Cherry Jacobus? Tweets? Oh, you've got another one that you I want do. to put up. I do. I just really want you to see these. I honestly, I just want you guys to see these okay. tweets. What number, Lee? Could you please? Post tweet number three, and this is an image of, oh my God. Uh, from the book oh God. of spells, charms, and incantations. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> why didn't you play this? <laughs> and what she writes, <laughs> it's almost always worked on me. I'm not really all that complicated. And she has highlighted one of the one of her favorite selections from page 97 of spells, charms, and incantations, and it's highlighted. You may fascinate a woman by giving her a piece of cheese. Oh my God. <laughs> That's an auto winner. You'd have, you, if you'd have played that first round, this would have been a sweeper. I mean, it's rigged, so you might as well have read anything. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Here rigged. We go. Yeah, rigged. Now you get to be bailiff, and you love being bailiff. I do. Actually, this is your honor. Right. May we please read a couple oh, other? Okay. Okay. Just, just give we... us one more. I'll give you one. I'll one give you the, more. The latitude of going one more. Okay, Lee. Please post uh, number exhibit five. I mean, yet again, this crooked judge is just letting Ashbrook do whatever he wants. That Wait, dog was, over. this is about uh, Joe Biden's German Shepherd. That oh. dog was protecting his human from dangerous, disloyal no. secret service. No. 
<laughs> Why didn't you play this? Why wouldn't you play these? I can't even imagine how you came up with the first one and not those if two. You, if you gave, well, what I was thinking was if you gave it to Smug, I was going to offer three for five. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I would have disqualified that. That's okay. I would Wait, have disqualified. This, this isn't a joke, though? It's not a joke. Wow. Oh That's my God! I just man, there, there was so much there was so much there. I, there are two others that are just bangers. I can't, I can't, I can't, I, I can't allow it. If she wins again next week, then I think she has to be retired, right? Three in a row. Well, we've done three in a row before. I think when you get to your fourth, oh, it's, okay. it's end of the ball game. You got to go away for a bit. Yeah. Well done. I mean, look, this is the problem you get with Sherry. She gets hot. She gets hot. She gets hot, and there's nothing you can do. Yeah. And and I will say this: Dow brought heavy game this week. Yeah. Heavy game. Uh, all right, so with that, we need to go to our interview. This is Frank LaRose. I want to welcome to the program a good friend. He's the Secretary of State for the great state of Ohio. He's now a Senate candidate in an absolutely must-win race. Frank LaRose, welcome to the program. Thanks. Uh, really great to be back here. And the room looked different last time I was here. Last time yeah. you were here, we had a, we, there's a few adjustments that we've made since then. Now, this is awesome. And you're right. This is a must-win race. It comes down to Ohio, West Virginia, and Montana. If we're going to take back the Senate majority, we've got to fire Sherrod Brown. Yeah. And only when we do that can we start to put this country back on track. So I'm excited about this. Yeah. And well, look, there's a lot of people that are excited about it. And you know, you're in a primary process right now couple of opponents you've got a pretty good electoral record uh you managed to win your last two statewide elections with big margins yeah, happy about that i mean I, I won more votes last year in re-election for secretary of state than anybody in the history of this office and the number that that really stuck out is i got a hundred thousand more votes than what sherrod brown got when he was re-elected yep. in 2018 very similar turnout cycles very similar models and uh, i was able to outperform him by a hundred thousand votes that shows that i've got that strength that it's yeah well take, 2018 take was not a great republican year Oh, yeah. Either. Yeah. Uh, he managed to squeak through in that Senate race. Mm -hmm. uh, largely, the environment was pretty bad, but you sort of outperformed all of that, it sounds like. And proof that I can raise the money. I raised $4.2 last year for a down ticket race that most, you and I know how important the Secretary of State's office yeah. is. Most people think I negotiate peace with Michigan yeah. or something, but <laughs> <laughs> as a proud Buckeye, I would never negotiate <laughs> peace with Michigan. But that's not the power the Ohio Constitution gives me. But yeah, so most people don't follow the Secretary of State's race, but I was able to raise a bunch of money for it. And, and really, Ohio's I've never heard of a Secretary of State raising over $4 million for yeah, a race. It was hard work. And it was, we did uh, 80 different events around the state. So it wow. was every little town and village in the state. And we were doing these, you know, ten and $15,000 fundraisers. But it was real Ohioans that yeah. said, we want somebody that's going to keep our elections honest, going to help people start new businesses. Those are the two things that we do at the Secretary of State's office. So yeah, it was successful. And I'm going to replicate that. We're going to, we're going to win this. Uh, that's great. Well, yeah. we're going to get into all of that, but I'd be remiss if I didn't start with what's staring at me down the dais here. Uh, you've brought something. So I almost made a big mistake, and I'm <laughs> going to admit it. I'm not one of these politicians that, that you know doesn't admit his, his errors. I almost brought a six-pack of beer. I'm a beer guy. My yeah. family's in the beer business. It's America's beverage, right? Yeah. I love beer. Uh, but I also I, I enjoy bourbon. So uh, my chief of staff, who's a minion, he's a big yeah. listener, <laughs> he, said, he said, you got to bring him bourbon. And so we talked about what we were going to bring. Bring. And this is OKI, which is Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. Oh, Three great states. There's no, it. there's no Minnesota in here. I'm sorry. Well, we're not you know? known for our bourbon. Yeah. So I mean, and, and it says right on here, uh, distilled in Indiana, bottled in Kentucky, and loved in Ohio. Oh <laughs> yes. Ohio is for lovers. And there's another state that has that. But yeah. so it's a really good, it's a really good <laughs> bourbon, and it comes from that corner of the country that you guys have won a lot of races yeah. in, in Kentucky. Uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, Ohio roots over yeah. here, and yeah. so uh, you know, there's that's this for you is guys. awesome. So enjoy Man, that. Look at that. And so great. Thank you. Back when I was gonna bring beer, I thought, well, let's do these pint glasses because here i'll turn those so we can see them on the camera so we've got oh, this, this really cool initiative that we started at the secretary of state's office called raise a glass to democracy mm -hmm. and the whole idea was this it is a time-honored tradition to talk politics over a beer mm -hmm. yeah over a drink of any kind and if you're not registered to vote well help talk is all you can do mm -hmm. right so we partnered with the ohio craft brewers the ohio uh, distillers and the ohio wineries to create this raise a glass to democracy initiative now here's the the secret though this 
least gives me an excuse to travel around the state and, drink beer. and do these great earned media <laughs> <laughs> events. And and but also to to promote voter registration. We've had thousands of people get registered to vote through this raise a glass to democracy thing. And and now other secretaries of state are calling me saying, "Can I steal your idea?" <laughs> Heck yeah, man, take it. So. Um, United Airlines was kind enough to break one of these. I originally brought four, but here we're down to three. Okay, uh, this every is vote awesome. Counts. This every is vote awesome. counts. Yeah. This is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, and there's no better encouragement than to tell people to get drunk and talk politics. That's right. exactly what you <laughs> Think want. About this: the the founding of our country has its roots in pubs, right? I mean, yeah. as they were gathering and saying, "We don't have to take this shit from the king anymore." <laughs> yeah, right. 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 So, right. It, it, it's kind of deeply embedded into American politics that we talk politics over a beer. And I love that. That's great. That a great idea yeah, and yeah. this stuff 98 proof you're not fooling around no that's sir that's not 98 proof around. are you kidding yeah serious no. bourbon for <laughs> serious men Put you on your ear i'm gonna i'm gonna pour a smug a tip topper when he gets in here we're gonna <laughs> see what happens we can just document what, it what could go wrong <laughs> what could go wrong <laughs> all right so we've got a lot of questions yeah. about and look i'm gonna turn to our ohio native to kick things off well, about you, this you know what you, you you talked about your work as secretary of state yeah. you've been extremely busy there yeah. there's a huge statewide constitutional issue going on right now 10 days from now is a special election and so I'd like to ask you to talk about that a little bit, but also about the fact that the early vote is apparently setting records. Yeah. And, you know, the early vote is a huge topic of conversation for Republicans all across the country. So yeah. I wonder if you could also say what's going right in Ohio that other states should probably try to adopt. So Ohio's found the right balance of easy to vote and hard to cheat. I kind of reject this idea that you have to choose either convenience or security. And kind of you hear this from both the left and the right. Well, if you're making it more secure, you must be making it less convenient. Or if you're making it more convenient, you must be making it less secure. We don't have to make a choice between convenient or secure elections. We have both. We remove dead people from the voter rolls. Drives the Democrats nuts for some reason. But we do that <laughs> on a monthly basis. We check IDs. We make sure that only citizens are registered to vote. And by the way, on the rare occasions that we catch people committing election-related crimes, we refer them for prosecution. I've yeah. referred over 600 individuals to law enforcement for prosecution because we take that seriously. So yeah, we make it hard to cheat in Ohio and trustworthy. We audit every election. We have a 99.9% .9 fidelity between the hard copy paper, which we audit every election, and those voting machines that are, of course, never connected to the internet. So you know, we make it secure, but we also make it convenient. We've got four weeks of early voting. We've mm -hmm. got four weeks of absentee voting, and we've got in-person election. Election Day voting. So when the left makes these stupid claims that Republicans want to suppress the vote, of course, that's not our objective. Right. If it was, I am demonstrably bad at it, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> because we have had record turnout in 2018, 2020, 2022. All good Republican years in yeah. Ohio, anyway. Yeah, and um, and and you know, again, Ohioans show up in large numbers because they know they can trust the vote on early voting. I mm -hmm. heard you talking with uh, with the chairwoman on this, and this is important, right? Because think about this: if you're a football coach, you know that you can score three ways: running, kicking, or passing, mm -hmm. right? Why the hell would you say, I'm going to go into this football game and I'm only going to score with passing? Yeah. That's foolish, right? And right. so, as, and I know she uses the term banking votes. Well, as Republicans, we can earn votes, bank votes, score votes, whatever you want to call it, using all three methods. And we need to take full advantage. Our state chairman in Ohio, Alex Triantafilu, great uh, great Cin guy from yeah, Cincinnati, Cincinnati yeah, yeah. son of the Queen City. Uh, you're going to uh, get him all going. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Longtime chairman and, down and, there. You know, I'm Italian. He's Greek, so there's some rivalry there. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's like, been, his slogan is, it's okay to vote this way, right? And Republicans need to know that if you're going to be traveling on August 8th uh, for our special election, then yeah, go into the Board of Elections, cast your vote early. We'll give you a sticker. I promise. Mm. Everybody yeah. gets a sticker, right? Yeah. And then you can also vote absentee in Ohio, which is real convenient. So we're seeing good numbers. The left was making this this silly claim that, you know, oh, people aren't going to know that there's a special election because it's being held in August. Nonsense. Ohioans, unless they're living under a rock, are well aware that there's an important constitutional amendment on the ballot on August 8th. And so, yeah, they're showing up in large numbers. And yeah, the Democrats may outperform us a little on early voting, but we'll make that up on election day and i think we're going to win this yeah, yeah. it's no, cool that's, yeah, that's very cool yeah. some yeah. local insight on that let me just ask you as an italian american does it sicilian offend? actually so let's be specific <laughs> all right here. does it it's, and careful it, yeah, and care <laughs> does it offend you uh, to put skyline ch chili on noodles no it doesn't it, it does no, not no it doesn't in fact i, I i'm a big skyline fan now 
I don't know whether I should be proud of the old man or not, but my dad <laughs> went to UC, University of Cincinnati. Uh-huh. He had a contest in his fraternity oh, man. back in the 70s, and it was who can survive the longest off of nothing but Skyline Chili. My dad went 12 <laughs> days, breakfast, oh. lunch, and dinner, a proud Italian American. And, and so, like, yeah, it, we love Skyline in our family. When we were kids, we'd load up and take the road trip from Akron because that you had to go to Cincinnati to get it back then. Now you can get it everywhere. Right. But uh, we would make the road trips down there. And, and yet, you know, the Italians have a long history of perfecting things that others invent. <laughs> the Chinese may have invented uh, pasta, but the Italians made it better, right? And so uh, I, I think that Skyline is an appropriate use of uh, of spaghetti. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, that's yeah. going to come with some controversy, but I understand you're a local guy, so that makes sense. You are here because you're a reservist. Yeah. And and that's, I mean, that's most people, they blow into town. And they're trying to hobnob with everybody. Yeah, uh, you're doing a different job. Yeah. No, and I, I love this. This is like my, uh, the thing I look forward to. I, on certain weekends, I get to be Sergeant First Class LaRose instead of Secretary of State LaRose I, I, uh, with a reserve unit to, not far from town here at Fort Belvoir. So I'm looking forward to that. In fact, this is this is the silly stuff they do. Uh, I had a, a Democrat tracker paid for by George Soros or some <laughs> other Cretan, right? And <laughs> as I was walking into an event this morning, he was running up to me with a camera saying, shouldn't you be in Ohio doing your job. Of course, you don't talk to trackers. You just ignore them. You blow on by and it smells like patchouli or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what I what I wanted to do is look him dead in the eye and say, I'm here for Army Reserve duty, man. I'm just yeah, getting a couple right. meetings done while I'm in D.C. But yeah, I look forward to that. And when I'm elected to the Senate, think about this, I'll be one of only two members who's actively serving in the armed forces, mm-hmm. Dan Sullivan from Alaska being the other one. Yeah. And uh, in fact, Senator Sullivan's website says he's the only member of the Senate serving in the armed forces. I told him over lunch a couple months ago, I said, I'm going to make you change your website. Yeah, you're going to make you change that, a little editing. So, you know, look, we had an opportunity a couple months back to sit down and and get briefed on your whole background. But I think for the benefit of our audience, why don't you talk a little bit about your military career and and everything that went into that? I mean, it started in my childhood in, in growing up in Akron, right? I was really blessed to be mentored. Like most of us in life have found mentors, but for me, it was a World War II veteran. Mm. Uh, My Boy Scout leader, right, was a, he was in his 70s at that point. He had liberated a concentration camp as a 22-year-old infantry officer, Bill Miller. In fact, we just lost him last year, long, like wonderful life, and we cherish his his memory. But my stories around the campfire that I heard as a 14-year-old punk (laughs) was about liberating a concentration camp. I said, God, I want to do something like that when I grow up. I want to do something. I want to live a life of service. And so I knew from probably the age of 14, 15 that I wanted to enlist in the Army. Now, Mm -hmm. as a rebellious teenage kid, my parents thought that was a terrible idea, (laughs) which cemented me even more into doing this is now exactly what I'm going to do. (laughs) So I left for basic training two, three weeks after high school. Never looked back. And ended up in, you know, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, in the middle of the country with kids from all walks of life, from Puerto Rico, from New York, from Texas, from Kansas. And I remember the drill sergeants, and these guys have a colorful way with words. It's pretty legendary, right? (laughs) And they said, I don't want to hear you idiots arguing about who's black and who's white and who's Hispanic, who's from the city, who's from the country. You pukes, you're all green now. And I remember looking down at my uniform, I'm like, yeah, we're all green. We got, we, this is this, this sort of great meritocracy in right. the military. It doesn't matter where you come. Of course, we're proud of our heritage, each of us, but it doesn't matter what your skin color is, whether your family was rich or poor, you're all green in yeah. the Army. And so I, I loved that. I, I ended up serving with the 101st Airborne Division as an engineer, deployed to Kosovo, got to see people vote for the first time there. Pretty remarkable yeah, thing. That's interesting. And, um, you know, the, the other uh, the other amazing experience for me was, was working on the U.S.-Mexican border. I was sent down there as part of a counter-narcotics task force. Mm-hmm. Oh. And so we were engineers during the day. I was running a D9 high track caterpillar dozer building roads for the Border Patrol. But at, at night, the Border Patrol would say, hey, who wants to come out on patrol with us? And so I'd be like, yeah, man, absolutely. And so, you know, we could we could help them uh, w- with the work that they were doing. And we were this was 20 years ago. Yeah. We were interdicting people coming across the border with children that weren't theirs, human sm- yeah. smugglers, right, human traffickers. and. In some cases, these children had drugs in their pockets. Oh, and, man. I mean, there's a special place in hell for anybody yeah. that would subject a child to, to that. And, and that was, again, that was 20 years ago. So for me, 
the border's not just some remote thing thousands of miles away. It's impacting Ohioans, drugs yeah. and crime coming across the border. And it's also not a photo op or a field trip. Some of these politicians, they go and they pose for their tough guy photo yeah. with the border mm-hmm. wall behind them, and they talk <laughs> tough, direct to camera and all that. Listen, I served down there. I know mm-hmm. exactly what we're up against. Uh, so I came home from that and Kosovo and everything else, and I was ready for a new challenge. And, and so uh, I, I was given the chance to try out to become a Green Beret. I kind of on a whim, I went to Fort Bragg and said, hell, let's give it a try, right? And was selected and part of that you know small number that actually makes it through the tryouts. And then I went through the two I mean, years you of training. Were, you knew what you were in for, right? You're oh, like, yeah. oh, I'll give it a try. Yeah, but That's uh, just you know, an easy thing, right? No, no, but <laughs> it was an arduous 30 I can, days, I can assure most you. people don't make it through that. Yeah, but I wanted to test myself. And, I, and again, I was still inspired by that idea idea that I can live a life bigger than myself and mm-hmm. do something that's truly worth doing. And I thought, well, becoming a Green Beret is a way to do that. And so I went through the training, became an engineer on a special forces team, had a great experience, traveled all around the world with my teammates. People, and I appreciate this, and I know it comes from a good place, but they say, well, thank you for your service. I'm inclined to say, well, thanks for paying your taxes because mm-hmm. I get to travel around the world with my best friends, <laughs> jump out of airplanes, use the world's most amazing uh, <laughs> firearms. Like this is this is incredible. I love my, I love my job. Uh, but we, we traveled to Morocco. We trained the king's special forces there in Morocco. We traveled to Oman, where we trained the sultan's special force, the SSF, they were wow. called. And, and just an amazing experience. And then got to deploy to Iraq. Mm-hmm. And when we got there, our mission was to take this group of Keystone cops and turn them into a SWAT team. I mean, these guys barely knew which end of the Oof. rifle the bullet came out of, right? And it was a group of Iraqi police officers that volunteered for this. And we turned them into a rather proficient tactical police team, a SWAT team. Yeah. And it was really rewarding because by the time we left, you know, we were able to point to a building and say, hey, the guy in there is building bombs, go get him. Mm-hmm. And uh, they would go in there, storm the building, bring the guy out handcuffed. It was just, it was, it was a really rewarding experience. And, and again, just like in Kosovo, I got to see people vote for the first time in yeah. Iraq. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, really a remarkable thing. And the purple fingers. And I, I told that story a lot on the campaign trail. You know, the, the, when people dip their fingers yeah. in purple ink, that's a way in a lot of these countries from just keeping people from voting twice yeah that's like the 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 fraud uh yeah yeah and it sort of became like their i voted sticker right because they don't have a sticker there so they they hold that purple finger in the air a lot of people don't realize how courageous these iraqi men and women were Mm -hmm. and think about these iraqi women i think it's fair to say not a country with a rich history of women's rights and these iraqi women showed up in massive numbers to vote despite threats of violence Mm -hmm. see the iranian-backed terrorist groups the bad guys that we were fighting on the streets of southern iraq on a nightly basis they told these iraqi that it was it was an ugly lie. They said it was un-Islamic to vote. Of course, that's unbelievable, a, completely false. And then they also said if you vote, you're collaborating with the American imperialists or whatever else. <laughs> Nonsense. They showed up in record numbers, even though these guys said we would cut your finger off if they had purple ink purple. on them. And so when these Iraqi men and women held that purple finger up, it might as well have been another finger. Yeah, you know, right. Right? Because they were saying, you can't intimidate me. I'm a free man. I'm a free woman. I did something remarkable by participating in my country's future as a voter. So that's something that stays with me. Uh, I came home from, from Iraq and decided I'd gotten a great education in the Army, but it was time to get a formal education, earned a degree from Ohio State, the Ohio, the Ohio State. State. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and, uh, you know, I try not to swagger too much, but it's a, <laughs> one hell of a school. And it's got a decent little football program, too. I've literally never met anybody from Ohio State who doesn't, like, just start in on it. I mean, there's nobody who's like Ohio State, and then that's it. But there's, like, another, like, four paragraphs of explanation. I get it. Well, you play football there. Decades of dominance, you know. It's <laughs> quite a thing. So as I started off at Ohio State, I was a... 28 year old college student. I was too old to join yeah, the that fraternity. Been a, I would have been the different eyeball. experience. So my fraternity, my social circle became people that worked on campaigns just by dumb luck. It was like, Hey, free beer and pizza. If you assemble yard that signs or pretty good. stuff envelopes or whatever. So I found this interest. And when I graduated, I had this degree from Ohio state. My head was saying, go out and earn a living in the business world. But my heart was saying, run for public office. And yeah. I'm, I'm glad I followed my heart. Yeah. Public service. It's followed you all the way through. Yeah. And that's what you're attempting to do next here. Tell us, I mean, look, you, you've had an extremely successful tenure as Secretary of State. You know the daunting challenge of a run for Senate. Yeah. Uh, you've seen it up close. You've presided as Secretary of State, you know, over these kind of elections mm-hmm. before. Uh, why is now the right time for you? Now's the right time because we've got a country to save. And, and I'm not a chicken little sky is falling kind of a person. I don't think it's hyperbole. Like we are in jeopardy of being the first generation in American history to leave this country weaker 
poorer, less secure. I'll be damned if I'm going to let that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to step up like each American generation has done throughout our history and leave this country stronger, more prosperous, and more secure than we found it. That's our job, right? As those that are inheriting this amazing thing called America, we're the, we're the protectors of this for the small period of time that we have. And so running for the U.S. Senate is a way to do that. And I see our country slipping away from us. I mean, the, the left, as you guys talk about all the time, is unhinged. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've lost their minds and they're deconstructing this nation. And uh, it's time that we step up and, and do something about it. Yeah. How about yep. some of the nuts and bolts on this? Well, I I am curious, and you kind of got got to this a few minutes ago, but, you know, Sherrod Brown has won three times already, and yeah. you can make an argument that he sort of has lived a charmed life in Ohio politics. He's won in cycles that were better for Democrats, but he's still, he's, he's, a, he's a tough out. And so I'm just wondering if you could yeah. walk us through the path to victory over Sherrod Brown this time. No, he is a tough out, and there's um, very few people that are as good at shaking hands and kissing babies and retail politics and all that, so I take nothing away from him. The problem is, he's fun fundamentally misaligned from Ohio. I mean, it would make sense if he was California's senator or Massachusetts's senator. The, the guy is on the far left fringe of his own party, totally but he's right. been so dedicated to this shtick for 48 <laughs> years. He's been in office for nearly half a century. It's Think wild. about that. Yeah. And he has spent that entire time carefully cultivating this phony public persona. I call it Sherrod's charade. He's convinced mm -hmm. people that he's a moderate. He's mm -hmm. not. Right. He's not a moderate. And the things that he uh, says don't match the things that he, he says he's for the working man, but the policies he supports here in D.C. are putting them out of business, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, and hurting Ohio families. He and the president think that you fix inflation by hiring 80,000 IRS <laughs> agents and spending trillions of dollars that we don't have. That doesn't fix inflation. It throws gasoline on the fire. Yeah. Sherrod Brown says on live television that nobody really cares about the border, only the far right. I mean, how out of touch can you be, Senator, right? And so we need somebody that's going to outwork him, and that's me. I mean, I've proven that, but also somebody that's going to expose him for the fraud that he is. Mm -hmm. and, and and we'll beat him, right? I mean, we've tried before, yeah. 2006, 2012, 2018, we've come up short. Uh, but what matters is that the right candidate emerges from the primary. I'm the only one who's both a father and a fighter. I'm, I've got this military background, but I'm also the only one that has school-aged children. So mm -hmm. I see what's happening in our schools. My 11-year-old comes home two months ago. Daddy, daddy, teacher says we're all going to die from global warming. <laughs> okay, darling, let's sit down and talk about this, right? And I'm an outdoorsman. We want to do reasonable things, but like I, EPA now means uh, eliminate productive activity, I think, right? Like they're, 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 they're genuinely obsessed with this, this fiction and, and, and there's nothing, uh, nothing that'll stop them. And they're trying to indoctrinate children. So, and I'm also the battle tested conservative. I'm the one that has yeah. a hundred percent pro-life, hundred percent pro-gun vote voting record and has a long track record of cutting taxes. I mean, $8 billion worth of taxes that we cut when I was in the state Senate. And that's exactly what I'll do in DC as well. And yeah, I know you remember the 2018 race, the yes. last guy to run against uh, Sherrod Brown was this guy, Jim Renacci. Mm -hmm. And he actually didn't do as well in some of the rural counties as I think in some of the Trump counties as, yep. as people expected. So I'm wondering, how do you, how do you, uh, do do better how do you run up the score on sherrod brown in in the rural parts of the yeah. state without sacrificing vote in suburban parts of the well state? we love our car dealers they're a great industry but i think what we've shown here is that car dealers can't beat sherrod brown right? <laughs> <laughs> shots fired shots uh, fired uh, uh, listen, we love that it's by the shoe way leather. it's shoe leather yeah. it, and and um it, it means being present in all 88 counties ohio's this big diverse state we're mm -hmm. kind of a microcosm of the nation we've mm -hmm. got these amazing appalachian communities communities. We've got these tremendous farm areas that really feed the world in so many ways. We've got thriving, vibrant urban areas that have just such a rich culture. You got to be all over Ohio. I'm the guy that's traveled to all 88 counties like, you know, a dozen times and they know me. And that's mm -hmm. why I've got like an 85% statewide name ID because I'm present. I'm there in Ohio asking them for their vote, but then proving to them that uh, I'm somebody that's going to carry their values to Washington, D.C. and be a credential conservative, but also somebody that knows how to solve problems, mm -hmm. right? Because 
it means bringing people together. If you're going to solve some of these big problems like a $32 trillion national debt, the, the great power you know, competition between us and China, uh, you know, the, the massive inflation that we're seeing and wages stagnant. Like if you're going to solve these problems, almost by definition, you got to be able to bring people together. That can happen in the Senate. And I'm somebody that's proven uh, that I can do that. Well, you certainly have done it from a vote counting standpoint. I mean, look, I think I'm not breaking any news to say there's an awful lot of statewide Republicans that have seen their coalitions shift pretty dramatically mm-hmm. over the last four to six years and over indexing in rural areas that were typically blue collar Democrats. And then this receding in suburban America, yeah. basically every city, cities that look a lot like Cincinnati, Columbus and sure. Cleveland. Um, but you haven't. And you've been able to maintain both of those constituencies. I assume that's what you just explained is part of it. And then you know, is tone a part of that too? I mean, yeah. you know, people don't like to get screamed at all the time in the suburban areas, I guess. Absolutely. And and, and it's also about just being genuine, right? Mm-hmm. There's so much phoniness in politics. Like, I'm a guy that grew up working on a farm. I understand agriculture. I served on our agriculture committee in the state Senate for eight years. And so I understand that. I, I come from a family that owns a small business. And mm-hmm. so I know about the real challenges that small business owners face. They're the first ones in in the morning and the last ones to leave. They, they know how to sign, uh, the, you know, know, not only the back of a a check, but the front of one and how Mm -hmm. to make payroll and and, and those kind of things. And so, yeah, it comes down to talking to people about the things they care about. And the red meat stuff is great. And I get it. And like, listen, I am, there's nobody that's more pro-gun, pro-life. You know, I'm all of those things. But you also got to talk to the people about the issues that are really impacting them on a daily basis. And it comes down to the kitchen table stuff. Mm -hmm. What are Ohioans talking about when they sit down for dinner at night? They're talking about how, you know, at the end of the month, the, the money's run out because their wages are stagnant and inflation is through the roof. They're talking about why the hell are my kids coming home from school saying that we're all going to die from global warming <laughs> or even more pernicious, this idea that America is this like racist, deeply flawed nation. Like that's the kind of nonsense that our children are being taught. Yeah. This nation has just like any collection of people. We've had our flaws over the years, but we're founded on an idea that is revolutionary today like it was 250 years ago that idea of human freedom and the founders knew that we're never going to be perfect but creating a more perfect union is our Mm -hmm. responsibility and we've done that over the years and so this country is that that shining beacon for the rest of the world and we need to be proud of america we need to teach our children to love america Mm -hmm. not this this liberal nonsense about uh, about hating our country Mm. couldn't agree with you more uh i gotta get you out of here but i can't do that without the three questions okay and these are the ones that everybody cares about. Uh-huh. I'm sure they loved everything up to this point. Yes. But this is this is serious business. Uh, I'm ready. If you could plan your last meal on earth, <laughs> what would it be? <laughs> it's going to be Cincinnati chili. I knew it. <laughs> it's going to be it. Cincinnati chili. And I tell you what, I do it as a four-way, which is, of course, the spaghetti, the chili, the onions, and the cheese. And I violate the rules, right? Because in Cincinnati, they've got a certain way to eat it. You're not supposed to cut it. But I twirl it like a yeah. good paisan. Well, I was just so, going to say, you don't have any choice. Yeah, That's but it's you... me mixing like the, 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 the time-honored <laughs> tradition of Cincinnati chili with my Italian heritage. So, there you go. I love that answer. That's I... the best answer anybody's given. Oh, the Jesus. The Cincinnati. We're over-indexed <laughs> on the Cincinnati stuff here. There isn't a conversation that's come up in the office any time in the last three months that somehow doesn't make its way back to Joe Burrow. Oh, there you go. It's like <laughs> a, lot to be a proud son of, of Appalachia That's himself, ex- right? Exactly I'm a right. lifelong Browns fan, though. So it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> when my wife and I first met, she asked me two questions. Honest to God. Are you a Republican? Because she'd been at Ohio University uh-huh. with what she called the crunchy liberal boys yeah, down there, yeah, and yeah. she wanted a real man. Yeah. She wanted a conservative. <laughs> so I answered that. I answered oh. that question correctly. But the second oh, yeah. question was, "Are you a Browns fan?" It's like, well, she's from a big football family. Her dad played for Ohio State, and you know all this. But months later, I said, why did you ask me, are you a Browns fan? And she said, I wanted to know you're loyal no matter what. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Proven. That perfect. is so good. Man, <laughs> she, so you perfect. all kicked your coverage on oh, that yeah. deal. Very, very lucky, yeah. man. And I've got three little girls, too. I'm, I'm, I'm happily outnumbered in my house. Oh, man, that's so great. Yeah. I love it. All right, so let's look at it this way. You're a relatively young guy, uh, but you've done a lot of public service. Yeah. And let's just erase all of it for a moment. And with the benefit of retrospect, you look back in your life with a big blue sky. You can fill it with absolutely anything. Yeah. What would it be? 
So uh, what would I be if I wasn't doing this? I mean, to me, politics is a service. It's a calling. It's not a career. It's something that it's good to have some experience and whatever else. It's not an entry level job serving in the U.S. Senate, I would argue. Yeah. And so having a little bit of background in it matters. But if I could do anything else, I would go back to my first job. I started off working on a farm as a kid and I loved it. If I could earn a living as a farmer, I would do that. And then the second choice, the, 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 the one right behind that would be being a full time soldier. I, I loved being on active duty in the army, the culture, mm -hmm. especially in the special operations community, is incredible. And as I heard you—you you, you, yeah. you heard me say, "I'll be the first Green Beret in Senate history." I'm going to bring some of that culture to the to the Senate. It, it's a, it's a very special place. I mean, you pick two tough gigs, right? right? I mean, you could just play center field for the Indians. <laughs> like, there are no Indians, though. That's the problem. <laughs> well, yeah, the Guardians. All Chiefs, no yeah. Indians. Right? It's very, very difficult to kind of keep up with. I do have one to one question to throw in here before you get. Oh to the yeah, last no, one. please. This is yeah. something we've been asking routinely and we've become something of a fi animal fighting podcast <laughs> and uh we you know we've got a guy who thinks he could take on a horse mano a mano so wow. we're very very interested he's wrong about that yes. but he does think it yeah very interested in the biggest animal that you feel like you could take on just with your bare hands no no weapons no nothing a rare species uh. <laughs> the american ass <laughs> <laughs> The donkey, of course. Now, actually, I've got a great photo of this, and I've, I've proven that I can beat them, and I'm going to beat another one next November. Uh, the donkey. When I was in Morocco, uh -huh. we were up in the Atlas Mountains training with the Moroccan Special Forces, and these guys are expert at, at, at pack animals and horses and, and all of that. And so they were teaching us how to move through the mountains on, on horseback and, and with, with donkeys. And so I said, well, can I ride this, this donkey? And they're like, they're, they're not easy. So I jumped on one, and I could not get the thing to move. And there's this great photo of me in uniform sitting on this donkey and, like, hitting it with a, <laughs> hitting it with a whip to try to get it to move. <laughs> and I've got that photo in my office. Oh, so, yeah, and I can whoop a donkey. I love that. Yeah. When this first started, I was afraid we were going to threaten his family value credentials. <laughs> I see where we've gone, and it actually works out pretty well. There's some synergy there into what you're doing right now, too. I get it. All right, so that makes sense. All right, so the final question, and this is kind of, we get a little esoteric with it, but our view is that, Almost every successful person is motivated by one of two things, a thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. Yeah. Not that anybody likes losing, right? It's just what motivates you to keep going, get to the next level. Michael Jordan character on one hand, where every championship he had, he celebrated for like two minutes sure. and then some insult that happened outside the locker room, he carries for 40 years, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. That's the agony of defeat person. Thrill of victory person's glass half full, self-motivated, sort of always charging up that hill. Yeah. Those two polls, Frank LaRose, where do you find yourself? It's the thrill of victory, no question about it, because it's why are you competing, right? Are you competing for a credential, for a trophy, like in sports? And that's great to be the best in the world, to have that championship. But in my line of work now that I've chosen, at least for this time, the victory means that you get to do something that'll make a difference. And that's why, to me, it's all about the thrill of victory, because when you win an election, you can bring conservative ideology, free market principles, and you can put this country back on track. So really, it, it's all about the thrill of, of victory. But you got to learn from the defeats. Those you are, do. That's the the lesson. You so, do. You'd be sure. surprised. I, we have like almost a 50-50 break on this question. Okay. It's really amazing. It's yeah, like and a, I didn't even have to hesitate. It's always it's about the thrill of victory yeah. because of what's next. Most people don't. Most people know, like intrinsically. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like a weird question, but it feels like everybody sort of sorts through it. Anyway, we really enjoyed this. If people want to support your campaign- yeah. Uh, keep up with what you're doing. Where do they go? It's franklarose.com. That's our website. We're a scrappy, uh, you know, uh, insurgent operation with a double digit lead in the polls, but running against two guys that can sell funds. So I'm working to raise that money. And so if you want to chip in a couple bucks, uh, franklarose.com is the place to do that. Frank, I can't thank you enough for coming in here. Good luck on everything. We really need to win this one. Absolutely. For the good guys so we can take back the Senate. That's my goal. That's my mission. Yeah, I love it. Thanks. Thanks. Great guy. Yeah. Uh, it, I am more satisfied with our candidates, and we've interviewed two of them here in the last week in Ohio than I've been about two candidates facing each other in a primary in a long time. you got to love him. And, I mean, his answer about what his last meal would be, chili spaghetti, mm -hmm. guy loves Skyline. Yeah. And, oh, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, spoke right to my heart. And I did ask him, if he, as an Italian-American, if he was offended by putting Skyline chili on, chili on noodles, and he wasn't. You know, is that a... Is that something to consider when casting your ballot? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not in Ohio. People, yeah. don't, people don't care for that kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, anyway, 
Great interview, great dude. We are blessed to have those two candidates in this race. And uh, may the best man win because we need to win it in the fall. Best map we'll have till probably like 2030. Yeah. So yeah. we got to take back the Senate. Gentlemen, I think we did it. I think so. Absolute banger of an episode. Gentlemen, thank you so much to all our listeners. Thank you so much for that wonderful interview. So until next time, minions, keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. We'll see you on Tuesday. Stay ruthless.